Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Vision, the show where we talk all about the College of Arts and Sciences and we also highlight students and faculty. I'm your host, Lindsay Poe. On today's show, we have Dr. James Chamberlain. He's an associate professor in the Department of Political Science. Thank you so much for joining us via WebEx today, James. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. So I like to start off interviews kind of just letting you introduce yourself, right? Tell us a little bit about your professional background and what led you to Mississippi and Mississippi State. So like a lot of faculty members here, it's a long and winding journey, I think, um, that led me here. I did an undergrad in the UK. I then shortly after that did a master's degree. And at that time I met my wife, um, who is an American citizen, and she kind of encouraged me to pursue my dreams of uh, graduate school and encouraged me to do that in the United States. So we then moved to uh, Seattle and I did my PhD in political science at the University of Washington. And then shortly after I graduated there, I had the interview here at Mississippi State and I got the job and that was in 2014. I've 2014. Been here since then. Yep. What a long journey. I mean, literally, physically, a very long journey to end up here at Mississippi State. And you've been here for what, almost a decade then? Yeah, well, I got tenure last year. It's been seven years, I think. Wow, Sounds right. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so that leads us to, since you're talking about tenure, your research, right? So tell the our viewers generally, you know, what is your focus when it comes to research and why you got interested in it? I mean, what I teach and the area that I work in is political theory or political philosophy. Um, did a philosophy undergraduate degree and that really just got me interested in all kinds of questions to do with kind of politics, um, but especially questions around justice, questions around freedom, equality, things of that nature. And I also got really interested in capitalism as an undergraduate. And so really since then I've developed those interests. Um, I have uh, one area of research looking at work and sort of meaning and value of work in contemporary society, another looking at borders and migration, and then just generally, um, and something that I'm working on a little bit more specifically at the moment is the topic of capitalism itself. Well, we're going to get to some of those areas when it comes to your book, Undoing Work, Rethinking Community. But I just am curious if your personal life, I mean, you grew up in the UK, you met your wife, she was an American. I mean, did that aid in some of your interests or did it develop it even more? Oh, it definitely did. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, the, the, especially the the interest that I have in work and in the sort of meaning that we attach to work had a lot to do with an experience that my wife and I had when we were first married, and that was that she was, um, well, before we were first married, she was not a, not a United Kingdom citizen. She couldn't work um, legally, and so you know that really I think opened our eyes to a lot of issues around that. Um, you know, and then thinking about kind of the. The, the status that one receives from having a job, um, that kind of stuff. So yeah, and then with migration, I think apart from the fact that I did migrate myself, you know, I've been really um, aware of the of the of the hardships that migrants face, especially crossing the U.S. border and um, and into Europe as well. Okay, so interesting, and you you alluded to this. So we're just gonna talk about your book. It was a big project for you. I know you have many books, but this is your most recent and it's Undoing Work, Rethinking Community. So you start with the proposition, you know, community and even let's say civilization are products of work. Can you explain what this means and why it might be, need to be challenged? Yeah, so the basic argument of the book is that we think that typically in sort of American society and in European societies especially, we, we think that full citizenship actually requires um, participating in gainful employment. So we think of someone as being a sort of fully participating citizen when they have a job. Um, and I argue that that is problematic in a number of ways, specifically from the point of view of freedom and also justice. And so that then leads me to trying to explore what could be some alternatives. Um, and so I look at, for example, flexibility, which we already have um, examples of flexible working arrangements within um, various labor markets and in particular in different employment situations. 
Um, and then also a, a, a demand or a proposal that's getting a lot of traction, um, especially since the pandemic, which is the universal basic income. And I look at that too as a, as a possible way to address some of these problems that I've identified. Okay, and then and, and another overall theme of this book is rethinking the idea of community. So right. how do we currently define community and how should we? Yeah, so I think to a large extent, my claim is that we think of community now as kind of the sum of individuals who belong to it. And it's as though, because of taking this individualistic focus from the beginning, we're kind of in search of some mechanism that can bind people together and can integrate people into society. And I think the reason work plays that function, where well, there are several different reasons, but uh, it goes back to this idea that I said, well, that you mentioned in the beginning about uh, this belief of work being at the foundation of civilization. So that's how we often think of it is community is something that individuals are kind of incorporated into. And then precisely the lack of work or fears of joblessness is what drive often um, these broader concerns that I identify in the book around kind of social disorder and uh, disharmony happening when there's too many people unemployed and things like that. So the alternative is quite tricky to, to, to articulate very briefly, but it's to actually recognize that on a fundamental level, human beings, whatever we do, exist in community with each other. So then it becomes less a question of, are you earning your place in a community because of the work that you do? And more just recognizing that as individuals, we are inescapably in community with other people. And that leads to a whole other set of conversations about what kind of duties we owe to each other and the value that we would place on those. Right, the sense that because we are, we are community. Exactly. Right? That's, I think, like the bare bones of what you're trying to say there. I mean, you're very much better at it than I am, but that's what I feel like I'm hearing is that essentially I live in a community. I, I am that community, right? It doesn't matter whether I'm working or not. So what I'm trying to get away from is, uh, and it's, a, it's a difficult line to walk, is um, a situation at the moment where what counts as a contribution that actually earns your place in society is basically paid work. A lot of things that people do that are incredibly socially valuable are not paid and then don't really uh, earn the person who does them that much respect within the eyes of society. So we've got a particular measure uh, in place or a particular value judgment about what counts as a, a, as a valid contribution. Mm -hmm. And I think the danger is that if you have any particular measure in place about what counts as a valid contribution to join society, then especially uh, more marginalized groups within that society, less powerful, less privileged groups within society will have their own ways of acting and contributing kind of diminished. And that's the real risk that I see from the point of view of justice. We need to have a very um, open sort of set of uh, activities that are valued within society and that none of them in particular actually counts as like the main mechanism that would get you to earn respect from other people. Right. I feel that um, my next question, you know, these changes, redefinitions is certainly at odds with capitalism, which is, you know, what we are all about in America, or what we're used to, right? So how do you think the current economic and social structures need to change? I mean, you've sort of said some of it, but just down to the point there. Yeah, I mean, I think that in, in part, what we need to do is lessen people's reliance on paid work. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. One is obviously, as I've mentioned, paying people this unconditional basic income, regardless of their eligibility um, or prior um, contributions into the system. And that's an idea that's been around for a while and actually attracts people across the political spectrum. So it's not wholly alien to the United States, nor is it an explicitly or exclusively leftist idea. Um, but I think other measures that would just um, lessen people's reliance on paid work, um, like um, publicly funded or subsidized um, services um, such as healthcare. Um, transportation, food, housing, and all those kinds of things. That can move us in a direction where people aren't quite so reliant on paid work anymore. And I think, just as a final comment, the pandemic has taught us what's actually possible in terms of um, you know, the, the, the stimulus checks being paid to people, um, what we're actually capable of doing collectively if we have the will to provide support for people who are in need is, is, is amazing. Uh, we just have to use our imaginations a bit more than I think we often do. 
Great, I'm glad you brought that up. I feel like your work is certainly very resonant, certainly in the 2020, right? The election period and then the pandemic. And I know you have done some work, uh, research regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. And since you brought it up, um, why don't you speak on that? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, it's, it's been surprising to me because, um, you know, people have um, obviously faced uh, an enormous amount of hardship and, and risk, frankly, in having to go to work and more privileged people such as myself have been able to more or less insulate themselves from that by working from home. But if we're talking about people whose jobs can't be done remotely, then they're having to go to work still. And obviously, there's dangers that come with that. Um, and I think, on the one hand, we've seen certain measures taken by governments to protect workers um, and, you know, providing furloughs, for example, to workers in a lot of European countries that did this or providing uh, ex extended unemployment and things like that to people. But I think what hasn't happened is a more robust support for people so that they can actually, um, you know, do what's safe in the long run to, to end the pandemic. And so that's been kind of illuminating, I think, because it also shows the way that capitalism itself um, interacts with these values around work um, in, insofar as um, doing the kind of things that I've talked about, providing support for people would cost a lot of money. And obviously um, there's heavy resistance to expanding, you know, government uh, aid from powerful courses. Right. Now, I don't want to leave out your most recent article, Responsibility for Migrants from Hospitality to Solidarity. We've got a couple minutes left. You want to give a synopsis on that work? Yeah, so basically, often in philosophy, but in politics as well, people think of um, borders and migration in terms of hospitality. So we think of um, host societies who receive, um, often they're praised generously for their hospitality, um, they're receiving migrants who are then seen as hosts. And I think um, this framework is useful to some extent. Uh, it has a kind of longstanding um, place within uh, the Christian tradition in particular, um, but in other traditions as well, in fact, um, within Islam too. But the problem with it is that it assumes that there's a rigid or very clear distinction between hosts and guests, and that hosts basically have a unilateral right to control uh, entry into their quote unquote homes and thus exercise um, discretion over who they allow to come in. And actually, both of those things are really problematic from the point of view of uh, both um, how the world actually works, the history of our countries, and how they relate to each other. But also on moral grounds, um, I argue that. We need to think much more about the kinds of um, broader sort of transnational structures that we're part of. And in fact, a lot of the reason why people want to migrate to wealthier countries has a lot to do with the colonial histories and the ongoing um, interconnections and workings of global capitalism in those countries, which means that we're actually, I argue, connected in ways that uh, trigger um, justice claims. And we therefore need to think about it more in terms of justice and solidarity with people crossing borders as opposed to sort of beneficence or generosity on the part of uh, our host societies. Well, Dr. Chamberlain, you have been so interesting to talk to today. Thank you for sharing your work with us and our viewers. <laughs> and thank you all for tuning in to this edition of Vision. We'll see you next time.